A friend I used to work with told me a scary story about his neighbor who has turned his life into something like a horror movie. I didn't believe him at first, but this neighbor, it seems, is known by others around there for acting really weird. Since hearing the story, a bunch of people have told me they think the same. Even my boss, who's like a mom to me, talked about it, and she's not one to make up stories. This scary stuff is happening in a small town in Ohio, not Michigan. It all started about five years ago, and it's been getting scarier, especially lately. The neighbor was always a little strange, but things got worse after he caught his wife cheating on him. He just lost it. First, we found our pets, dogs, dead. Someone had shot them. It wasn't hard to guess who it might have been, because there aren't many houses around here. This happened more than once, but we never called the police because of a few reasons. The man was known to be dangerous, and there was no proof it was him. Plus, if the police came and found nothing, he'd know we were the ones who called them. Fast forward to a few months back, another pet went missing. I decided to search the woods near our place by myself because my buddy was too scared. I wasn't out long when I heard something. Searching, I spotted him. Considering what he'd done before, I knew I had to get some proof. I took out my phone to record. I tried to sneak closer and hid behind a tree, only showing my phone to record him. He was in a clearing, digging a big hole under some trees. I yelled out to see how he'd react. That was a bad move. You'd think a normal person would look around to see where the noise came from, right? Not him. This guy jumps out of the hole, grabs a gun, and starts pointing it all around. After I ran away, I couldn't stop thinking about what he was digging for in the woods. Nothing made sense, but then again, Nothing he does ever does. A few nights later, my dog got loose again. The invisible fence we used wasn't working right. It was 3 a.m. and my dog was nowhere in our yard. Luckily, I had a friend with me this time to help look. We walked through the woods and saw that the neighbor's garage was open and the lights were on. We got closer, curious. I took out my phone, remembering the last time. I gave my phone to my friend and went around the back to look for my dog, while my friend stayed in the front. Then I saw him in the garage working at his bench. I had to look twice because I couldn't believe it. There he was, at 3 a.m., sharpening what looked like spears. Yes, spears. He stopped after a while, went inside, and then came back out through a door near the garage. My friend hid at the side of the garage to watch. There was a light on the side of the house, and he could see everything. The man came out, picked up a very heavy black bag, and put it in his wheelbarrow. To understand how heavy, you should know this guy is really strong. His brother said he can lift about 500 pounds. So whatever was in that bag was not just trash. He paused for a moment, grabbed a shovel to go with the bag, and headed into the darkness towards the woods. It was the same direction where I had seen him digging earlier. I couldn't shake off what I had seen, so a couple of nights later I went back to his place. This time I arrived just as he was pulling another bag out of the garage. But then, things turned even stranger. He dropped the bag and started hitting it with his fists, then took a golf club and hit it even harder. After a few hits, he threw the club aside, loaded the bag into his wheelbarrow, gave the shovel a hard smack against the bag, and headed into the woods again. This brings us to a few weeks ago. My dog had been missing for a few days. Worried sick, I decided to take a risky move. After noticing he had gone out, presumably hunting, I sneaked into his house. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but I hoped to find any sign of my dog. I started searching from the basement up, but it was on the second floor that my heart sank. I heard the front door open. He had returned. In a panic, I hid in the closet of the nearest room, which happened to be his bedroom. I closed the closet door and crouched down, hoping he wouldn't come in. But he did. He walked into his bedroom, still in his hunting gear and mask, and placed his gun on the desk. I was frozen, not knowing his next move, how long I'd be trapped, or what he'd do if he found me. I felt like I was in there for hours, but it was only a few minutes. When suddenly there was a noise from downstairs, it felt like a stroke of luck. He grabbed his rifle and rushed downstairs. Seizing the moment, I sprinted down to the basement and out of the house while he was distracted. I never thought I could run so fast. After escaping from his house, I dashed through the woods and made it back to mine. The good part of all this? 
I'm still here. And that noise that made him grab his gun and rush downstairs. It was the police, there with a warrant to arrest him. I'm still trying to piece together what exactly he's been up to. His brother and the cops haven't shared much with me. I left a hint for the police about the woods, but as far as I know they haven't searched there yet. Hopefully, he's still locked up. Here's what happened next. My friend and I went into the woods, making sure he wasn't around, to check out what he had been digging. We found a circle of those spears stuck in the ground, with big holes in front of them, some filled in. They looked just like graves, about six feet deep. I can't figure out what he was planning, but I'm keeping my eyes open. Another update. While the creepy neighbor was in jail, I did some work for his brother during the summer. He's a bit odd, but not as bad as the neighbor. He wanted a big hole dug in his basement, saying it was for drainage, but it needed to be big enough for someone to fit in. The basement had this terrible smell like rotting meat, similar to a dead deer left out in the sun. Why did I agree to do it? Well, I've dealt with strange people before, and he didn't seem as dangerous as his brother. Plus, I needed the money. After finishing the job, I left as quickly as I could. Now for the final update on this story. The neighbor is out of jail and back home. This all happened between 2015 and 2016, and it's been quite a while since these events unfolded. Maybe there was a dark secret, or maybe he's just another troubled soul, which isn't rare around here. It's been years since I last spoke with the person who told me this story, but I might reach out for more updates. If there's any new information, I'll be sure to share it. Stay safe, everyone. I'm a woman of 32 years now, but this scary tale happened when I was just 13. One evening, I was over at my friend's house for a sleepover. Let's call her Emma for the story. Emma's home was in a not-so-nice part of town, a short walk from where we went to school. Her mom, raising her alone, was working till late that night, leaving us the freedom of the house. She made sure we had plenty of snacks and let us pick movies to watch to our heart's content. It was still light outside, so we decided to take a stroll to the nearby pond and park area, not far from Emma's place. As we were making our way back, almost reaching Emma's house, a car came up from behind us. I didn't know who it was, but Emma recognized him immediately. She whispered to me, That's Mike, our neighbor. Mike appeared older, probably in his fifties, with a noticeable gray beard and always wearing a baseball cap. He slowed down his car next to us, asking about our plans for the night. Emma cheerfully shared that we were planning a night of pranks on other kids and watching horror movies. Mike laughed in response, but something about his smile made me uneasy. I wondered why Emma shared so much with someone I considered a stranger, but perhaps she trusted him more. In a low voice, Mike remarked, Looks like your mom's not home again, working late, right? Emma, in her usual carefree way, replied, Yes, she's on the night shift, so we've got the place to ourselves. That same unsettling smile crossed Mike's face again as he said, Well, have a great time at your sleepover and try not to cause too much trouble. With that, he drove off to his house, glancing back at us as he walked inside. Once we entered Emma's house, I couldn't help but express my concerns about Mike. His presence had genuinely unnerved me. Emma reassured me saying she found Mike a bit weird but didn't think he was dangerous. Emma was always the one who saw the good in people, while I was more careful and worried about things. That night, after making a pizza and gathering snacks, we settled in to watch movies and chat with friends online until late. It was past midnight and Emma's mom hadn't returned. We were starting to doze off in the living room with a horror movie playing quietly on the TV. Suddenly, Emma muted the TV and whispered to me, I think I saw the motion sensor light in the backyard turn on and off. She crept to the window to check, and I followed quietly behind her. We saw nothing at first, but then the light came on again. Try as we might, we couldn't make out anything outside. Determined to get a better look, Emma suggested we head to the basement, where we might see more through the window there. We tiptoed down, careful in the dark, avoiding any lights to stay hidden from whatever was outside. Emma's sudden caution surprised me. She was usually the relaxed one, but the night's movies might have gotten to us. The basement had a big window and a door that led to the backyard. As the motion light came on again, 
we could see a bit inside the dim basement. Then, the door started shaking as if someone was trying to open it. We screamed, our hearts racing. We couldn't see who was outside because the door's window was covered. The door was locked, thankfully, but fear overwhelmed us. Emma found a baseball bat nearby and slowly approached the door. I begged her to back off, suggesting we call for help instead. Ignoring my pleas, Emma bravely, or perhaps recklessly, lifted the blinds just a bit to peek outside. Emma lifted the blinds slightly, and to our shock, it was Mike, the neighbor outside. Both of us screamed at the sight of him. Mike quickly raised his hands, trying to calm us, saying, Hey, it's alright. I'm not gonna harm you. I saw someone in your yard and thought to check if you two were okay since it's so late. But looking into Mike's eyes, Emma and I could see something wrong, something dark. It was clear to us he was lying, trying to get into Emma's house under false pretenses. Emma yelled at him, warning him to leave or she'd call the cops. Mike seemed unfazed, insisting he was just checking on us because he knew we were alone. He reached for the doorknob again, asking us to open the door. I yanked Emma back, urging her to call the police. I shouted at Mike, telling him we were calling the cops and he should leave immediately. He paused, glaring at us menacingly, then turned and disappeared into his own yard. We rushed upstairs, and just then, Emma's mom came in. Breathlessly, we tried to explain what happened with Mike. Her mom was startled but hesitant to involve the police, arguing that Mike hadn't actually entered the house or harmed us. Emma and I were terrified, pleading with her to report him, but she maintained there was little the police could do. Thankfully, I never encountered Mike again after a few more visits to Emma's place. Soon, Emma and her mom moved away. I still wonder what Mike intended that night, but I'm relieved we never had to find out. When I was younger, going to elementary school, my brother, mom, and I moved to Canada from another country. We found a place to live in an apartment where many people who had come from different places lived too. One day as we waited for the elevator, a lady and her daughter who couldn't walk or talk well came to wait with us. They spoke a kind of Farsi, but it was different from what we spoke back in Iran, more like what people speak in Afghanistan. My mom was really happy to meet someone else who spoke Farsi, even if it was a bit different and they lived close by. This lady's daughter had a hard time talking or using signs because of her health problems. We kept seeing this lady and her daughter around our building and neighborhood. But there was a problem. The lady thought a man was following her daughter, trying to cause trouble. This man had a daughter a little older than me, and I knew them. I had even taken care of their dog before. The man's daughter told us that her parents had split up, and she lived with her dad now. One evening, after my mom and I got back home, we ran into this lady right outside the elevator. She told us it was her daughter's birthday and asked us to come over for some cake. I didn't really want to go. Something about her made me feel uneasy. But my mom felt sorry for them and said we wouldn't stay long. So we went to their apartment and right away I felt something wasn't right. Her daughter was sitting in the dark with just a small light on. In the living room, there was a cloth on the floor with some plates, forks, and a homemade cake, like a picnic inside the house. I was just starting to relax when my mom's phone rang, making us jump. As my mom answered it, the lady came in quickly and told her to turn her phone off. She said we needed to be very quiet so that the man wouldn't know we were there. That moment, I felt a cold shiver down my spine. Who is doing this? My mom asked, confused and worried after hearing what the lady had said. The lady then shared more about the man living below them. She said he would hit his ceiling with a broom at all hours trying to scare them, showing he knew they were up there. She told us a really scary story about how this man almost convinced her daughter to jump off the balcony. She also said that he would come to their door late at night, knocking softly, and then whisper scary things through the door, talking about evil stuff. My mom asked why she hadn't told anyone, like the police, about this. The lady said she was too afraid that if she did, the man would find out and hurt them even worse. She explained they lived in total silence to avoid making any noise that might attract his attention. They didn't even turn on the lights or watch TV, just whispered to each other when they needed to talk. After eating the cake and saying thanks for inviting us, we got ready to leave. 
The lady moved very quietly to her door, gesturing for us to stay out of sight. She looked around carefully before telling us it was safe to leave. When we got back to our place I told my mom that I didn't believe the lady's story because I knew the people who lived in the unit she was talking about. But my mom told me it was better not to get involved and to just forget about it. After that we didn't see the lady or her daughter for weeks. Then, one day on my way to school, I noticed some letters taped up in the lobby of our building. They seemed random and I thought maybe they were from the building's management. But then I saw a letter stuck to the intercom outside. It was from the lady, talking about how scared she was for her and her daughter's safety. She wrote that she had tried to get help many times but nothing had changed. The letter detailed the same terrifying things she had told us that night. Reading the last part of her letter made me feel really cold and scared. In her letter, the lady said something terrifying and strange. She claimed a demon attacked her in her sleep, causing her to have a child. She believed this demon was now living in the man below us. She warned that if anything bad happened to her or her daughter, we should feel guilty. Curious and confused, I talked to the girl and her dad about these claims. The dad told me he barely knew the lady, having seen her only a couple of times, and never really looked at her because she acted strangely, talking to herself, which scared him. He mentioned finding notes she slid under his door, filled with Arabic writing. After showing these to a friend, he learned they were verses from the Quran, used for protection against evil. He realized she was the one leaving the notes only after seeing her letters all over the building. He explained that they were asked to leave their apartment because she threatened to harm herself and her daughter by setting them on fire. The building management had to call the police because she was a danger to herself and others. Eventually, we all moved on and even left that part of town. But I couldn't forget about what happened. In 2015, I went back to the old building to meet a childhood friend and ended up talking to the building manager. I asked him about the lady and what had happened to her. He told me she suffered from schizophrenia and had a very tough life, forced into marriage young and her daughter's disabilities were due to severe abuse during pregnancy. The lady truly believed her own terrifying story. She kept her daughter, who was actually a 30-year-old woman, hidden from the world. The daughter appeared much younger due to malnutrition and lack of care. She had never been to a hospital or school. It was a deeply sad situation, revealing how much the lady and her daughter suffered. I am now 32 years old, but this scary thing happened when I was just 13. One night I was at my friend's place for a sleepover. Let's call her Lily for this story. Lily lived in a part of town that didn't feel safe, and it was not far from our school. Lily's mom, raising her alone, often worked until late, so we had the house to ourselves that evening. Her mom had left us lots of snacks and said we could watch as many movies as we wanted. While it was still light outside, we decided to take a walk to the nearby pond and park, just a short walk from her house. On our way back, when we were almost home, a car came up behind us. I didn't know the man in the car, but Lily recognized him right away. She whispered to me that he was their neighbor, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith seemed old to me, maybe around 50. He had a gray beard and was wearing a hat. He slowed down his car and asked us what we were doing that evening. Lily told him we were having a sleepover and planned to play pranks on some school friends and watch horror movies. Mr. Smith laughed and gave us a smile, but something about it made me feel uneasy. I wondered why Lily told him so much, since I didn't know him at all. Maybe she trusted him more. Then Mr. Smith spoke in a quiet voice. So, Lily, I see your mom's car isn't here. She must be working late again, right? In her friendly way, Lily said, Yes. She's on the late shift, so we have the place to ourselves tonight. Mr. Smith smiled that odd smile again and said, Well, enjoy your sleepover, girls. Just don't cause too much trouble. He then drove off slowly to his house. As we walked up to Lily's house, it was chilly outside, so I put on some warm clothes, grabbed my phone, and drove off to her place. I texted Ava I was on my way. Driving there, I felt incredibly lucky. Meeting a girl the first day I tried the app was beyond what I had hoped for. I couldn't wait to tell Mike about this. However, as I drove, the roads grew emptier, surrounded by nothing but woods. Houses became scarce, and streetlights were almost non-existent. It took me nearly an hour to reach Ava's address. 
Upon arrival, I messaged Ava I had arrived and looked up at the house. It seemed old and neglected, which gave me a weird feeling. Despite this, I walked up to the front door, noticing the overgrown grass. I messaged Ava again, asking if I was at the right place. She confirmed, telling me to come in and call out for her. The house was dark and felt abandoned as I entered. My attempt to message Ava again failed. My phone had no service. I decided to look for her and walked into what appeared to be the living room. The furniture was old and covered in dust. Then my eyes caught something chilling, a bright blue dress hanging from the ceiling. Seeing the blue dress Ava wore in her profile pictures hanging there, alongside a black wig, threw me off. Ava's hair was black in all her photos, so this didn't make sense. I called out for Ava, hoping she'd respond, but instead of her voice, I heard a deep eerie yes from behind me. My heart nearly stopped. When I spun around, Ava was nowhere to be seen. Standing there was a man in a black hoodie and blue jeans, his brown hair peeking out from under the hood. He gave me a chilling smile and a wink. Confused and scared, I asked him who he was. He didn't speak. He just gestured towards the dress and wig with a haunting grin, holding something that looked dangerously like a gun. He demanded everything I had, voice deep and threatening. Not wanting to risk my life, I emptied my pockets into the bag he thrust at me, including my watch. After taking my belongings, he walked out, leaving me frozen in fear. Once I could move again, I dashed to my car and drove straight to Mike's place, not once looking back. Mike called the cops for me, and I recounted the whole nightmarish encounter to them. The investigation revealed the man had been masquerading as Ava online. The dress and wig were part of his disguise, and the house was just an abandoned property he used. The most terrifying part? They never caught him. That was the end of my adventures with dating apps. I'm not sure how to start this, but let's begin with some background. I'm a 25-year-old woman now, but I was around 21 or 22 when I first moved into my apartment. The building I lived in was usually very quiet. It was home to a lot of young families and elderly people. It was located next to a golf course in a small town where not much crime happened. Two years after I moved in, a couple in their 40s moved into the apartment next to mine. I never learned their names, but the husband knew mine somehow. That wasn't very strange because the elderly neighbors liked to talk a lot, and they probably mentioned my name during a conversation. I tend to trust my instincts about people, and they usually tell me if someone is not trustworthy. From the start, the husband gave me a strange feeling. Looking back, he didn't do anything unusual at first. It was just a feeling I had. Whenever his wife was around and I tried to talk to him, he would interrupt her and speak for her, which was odd. It was strange, but I didn't think much of it. Then, about a year after my boyfriend moved in with me, he had an accident on Christmas Eve. He fell from a golf cart and hurt his head badly. He couldn't drive for six months, so I had to drive him to work and back every day. He loves his job and usually works late, so I was often home alone until late at night. Somehow, the creepy neighbor found out about my boyfriend's injury and that he wasn't driving. This meant he knew I was alone most evenings and he started doing things to scare me. There's one thing that happened that still scares me when I think about it. I'm so glad we moved far away from that apartment to a house in the countryside. One evening after coming back from the store or visiting a friend, I was sitting in my car in the parking lot, looking at my phone with the doors locked because I'm always cautious. After about 10 minutes, just as I was about to turn off the car and go inside, I looked to my right and saw my neighbor standing in the walkway of our building, directly across from my car. It was around 9 p.m., so I thought he might be out for a walk with his dog or throwing away trash. I kept playing with my phone trying to ignore him, but when I looked again he was still there, just a shadow standing in the light. I remembered being told to look straight at someone who makes you feel uncomfortable, so I stared at him until he stepped back into the shadow, out of my sight. Now I was really scared but decided not to leave my car, at least not until I had to pick up my boyfriend from work. I dimmed my phone's screen to make it harder for him to see me sitting in the dark. In a few minutes he appeared again, walking from the other side of our complex. He wasn't with his dog or taking out trash, so I guessed he had already been to the dumpster. He walked past my car, stopped, and looked directly at me, 
pointing with his fingers in a strange way. Then he went to his work van, parked a few spots away, and took out some empty grocery bags. He took a long time with the bags before walking back the way he came, stopping again to stare at me before moving on. He kept stopping and turning to look at me, like a game of stop and go on the sidewalks that formed an H from above. Our apartment was to one side, and he had first appeared on the other. Feeling a cold fear, I texted my boyfriend about the neighbor's creepy behavior, feeling sure he was trying to scare me. We were both nervous when we got back home. As I was unlocking our door, my boyfriend went back to the car, and there was the neighbor, casually greeting me by name, though I'd never told him my name. It must have been another neighbor who mentioned it, but it was still frightening, especially after what happened. This man had done many other things that scared me, both before and after that night. My boyfriend, usually not one to worry, insisted on walking with me to the dumpster and the laundromat. He couldn't dismiss this as just a weird encounter. Writing this down, I struggled to convey how truly eerie it was. Maybe I was overreacting, but my instinct told me something was wrong and I listened to it. This story is about something scary that happened to me when I was 13 years old. I lived in an old house that was built in the 1980s. Right after we moved in, we met one of our neighbors. We'll call him Bob to keep his real name a secret. He came over with a cake to welcome us to the neighborhood. We said thank you, and later talked about how nice it was of him, because we had never gotten a cake from a neighbor before. A few months later, Bob started acting more and more strange. For example, he began to appear at my bus stop in the afternoon, even though he didn't have any kids. I told my parents about it, but they didn't take it seriously. They thought he must have a good reason for being there. He started paying more attention to me and my brothers. Let's name them Nathan and Gabe for the story. Nathan, my older brother, was 14, and Gabe, my younger brother, was 12. Bob would often come to our door, asking if he could join us for dinner. My parents began to find him odd and thought maybe he had some mental health issues. I told them this wasn't a good excuse and that he was really starting to scare me, but they said I was just being too sensitive. Then my parents went on a trip for their anniversary, leaving me and my brothers alone at home. The day was pretty normal, except for the usual creepy stares from Bob. But other than that, nothing out of the ordinary. At night, Gabe went to bed early, so only me and Nathan were still up. Nathan's room is on the other side of the house from mine. Around 10 p.m. we heard someone knocking on the door. I thought it was weird to have someone knock so late on a school night. I didn't want to get up and check, thinking it was just me being lazy. But the knocking didn't stop. It got louder and more urgent. I finally decided to go see who it was. But as I got closer, I heard Bob's voice saying, I know you're home alone. I saw your parents leave this morning. I got so scared that I dropped to the floor and crawled to Nathan's room to tell him what was going on. I said we should call the police, but Nathan was against it because Bob hadn't actually done anything yet. So we decided to stay in Nathan's room, hoping that Bob would go away. I lay down on the floor trying to calm down, but then we realized we had forgotten Gabe. His room was next to the front door, right where Bob had been knocking. We quietly went to Gabe's room and woke him up. It seemed like Bob had left because it was quiet outside. Curious and worried, I couldn't help myself and looked through the peephole. At first I saw nothing, but then as my eyes got used to the dark, I saw Bob's eye staring back at me. I screamed and told Nathan to call the police. Even after hearing me scream and knowing we were calling the police, Bob didn't leave. Instead he started to hit the door with his body, trying to break in. We ran to the bathroom, the only room without windows and with a strong lock. The 911 operator told us to stay calm and hide. We heard the front door break open and Bob searching the house. He came upstairs. We turned off the bathroom light so he wouldn't know we were there. My heart sank when he stopped right outside the bathroom and said, I know you're in there. We were so scared, trying to stay quiet. He began to hit the bathroom door. We thought that was the end for us. We hugged each other, crying. But then we heard police sirens. Bob stopped and ran back to his house. The police came and we pointed them to Bob's house. They talked to him and called our parents, who came home right away. We moved out a few months later. This story still scares me, not just because it was terrifying, 
but because I keep thinking about what could have happened if Bob had managed to break in before the police arrived. I don't know why he stopped, but I'm glad he did. Bob was a real creep, and I hope he's in jail now, where he can't scare or hurt anyone else. A few years back, when I was just starting high school, something scary happened. It was towards the end of May, and I stayed up late to study for an important test in Spanish. Around midnight, all our dogs began to bark loudly. This was strange, because we lived in a safe neighborhood in Southern California where not much bad stuff happened. I thought maybe they saw a small animal like a raccoon or a skunk. The dogs wouldn't stop barking, so I tried to calm them down, but it didn't work. Soon. My dad came down, looking very sleepy. Just then, we heard a loud noise from outside. I was scared, but told myself it was probably just an animal. The dogs were now angrily barking at the window. My dad didn't want the noise to wake up my mom and brothers, so he went outside with a flashlight and a broom to scare the animal away. I watched nervously from the window as he checked around our trash cans. Suddenly, my dad yelled in a way I had never heard before. My mom rushed downstairs to me. She quickly took me away from the window and back to my room, but I kept watching from there. I saw a woman covered in blood, holding a bag, probably with her clothes in it. She was crying and talking to my dad, but I couldn't hear what she said. Later, I learned that she was asking my dad to let her stay with us because her husband, who had drunk too much, was hurting her. She said she lived in the house next door. We had just moved in about a month before and hadn't met those neighbors yet. My dad said he would talk to my mom about it, but when they came inside, the woman rushed past them into our house. From my room, I couldn't see anything but could hear bits and pieces. The woman spoke with a strong Eastern European accent. When my mom suggested calling the police, the woman claimed she already did. I stayed in my room, filled with fear, wondering if the violent husband might come after us. Time passed, but no police arrived. My dad offered to call them again, but the woman kept saying no. My mom came to check on me, immediately locking the door behind her, saying she felt something was very wrong. She called the police herself, and they had no record of any call about trouble in our area. She told me to hide in the closet, which seemed odd, but I did as she said. From my hiding spot, I could only hear muffled sounds, so what follows is what my mom told me happened next. After leaving my room, the woman didn't seem scared anymore and went to clean up in our bathroom. My mom shared her fears with my dad, saying they needed to get the woman out of our house. Then they heard a noise from the bathroom. Heading there, they found no one. Instead, the woman had moved to our family room, stuffing our expensive electronics and other items into her duffel bag. Suddenly, she pulled out a large kitchen knife and demanded to be taken to my mom's jewelry. The layout of our house played a crucial role here. My parents were in the kitchen, separated from the family room where the woman was by a door that locks from the kitchen side. They ran to lock it, but as they did, the woman attacked, cutting my dad's arm. They managed to lock her in, and she eventually fled through the back door, only to be caught by the police hiding under a car nearby. She was arrested, found to be under the influence of drugs that made her aggressive. The thought that terrifies me is what might have happened if my parents hadn't managed to secure her in part of the house. My dad needed stitches for his arm, and I had to see a therapist to cope with my fear triggered by the dogs barking at night. Thankfully, no one was seriously hurt, except for my dad's injury. The ordeal left us all shaken, but we were relieved it ended without further harm. Back home, still shaking from the scare, I eventually calmed down and checked my phone. That's when I saw a text from Anna that read, You got lucky. This whole event turned into my most unforgettable Valentine's Day, yet it left me confused and scared. I had met Anna before, so I knew she was real, not someone pretending to be someone else. Over time, I've thought it over a lot. Either Anna was part of a plan to trap me, or perhaps she lost her phone and the person who found it decided to target me, seeing my contact in her phone. Both possibilities are equally disturbing to me. This all started when I was nine years old. My family and I used to visit my grandma's place often, but we hadn't been there in a while because she had moved to a new house. So when my parents said we were going to see her, I couldn't wait. 
but arriving there I got confused. Her house was stuck to another one which seemed odd to me because I was just a kid. I ran up to knock on the door, too eager to wait, but when it swung open, the people inside weren't my grandma and her family. It was a completely different family. Feeling embarrassed, I quickly closed the door and pretended like nothing happened. Later, feeling bored, I wandered out to the backyard. Since the houses were connected, I noticed the neighbor staring at me from his side. It was a bit scary, but I ignored it. Then my mom gave me a huge lollipop, which made me really happy. I was enjoying it in the backyard when I suddenly ran into the neighbor. He was a big, older man, and he didn't speak English very well, but I could understand him. He asked me about my lollipop in a way that made me uncomfortable, especially because of how he smelled. Then, without waiting for my answer, he took my lollipop, tasted it, and said, Well, what's yours is mine now. I just walked away and threw the lollipop out. A week after that I tried to forget about the incident, but then, while playing in my grandma's backyard again, I heard someone whispering, Psst! Psst! Hey! Over here! From an old shed. I was curious but also hesitant. Despite my better judgment, I decided to investigate the noise. Before I continue, I want to warn everyone that this part of the story involves harassment. Also, I want to clarify that I am a girl. As I stepped into the shed, a hand grabbed mine so tightly I thought it would snap. Suddenly I was thrown to the ground. I couldn't even scream or cry. I was in total shock. Everything happened very fast. Then I heard the sound of a belt being unbuckled. Just then, my mom called out for me, and that snapped me back to reality. I ran out to find her as fast as I could. My mom asked me if I was okay, and in that moment, I really wished I could tell her everything, but I kept silent. As days passed, I kept thinking about what happened. I was just a kid and didn't understand if what he did was allowed. He was an adult and I was a child. I even thought that if I told my mom, maybe I would be the one in trouble. It sounds silly, but remember, I was just a child, not knowing much about these situations. I hoped that was the end of my story, but unfortunately, it wasn't. Summer came, and my grandma's house had a pool. We decided to have a pool party, and my grandma invited the neighbor and his family. Strangely, I don't recall seeing his family there, just him. And there he was, in the pool, right next to me. Despite my family being nearby, I tried to ignore him, but then he moved closer and smiled at me. Suddenly I felt his hand touch me. I looked around, trying to catch someone's eye for help, but everyone was busy enjoying the party. I thought about yelling for my mom but was afraid I'd get in trouble instead. So I just got out of the pool and pretended like nothing happened. I kept this to myself, which I regret deeply. Now, I'm 19, almost 20, and this experience still haunts me. I finally told my mom and started therapy. It's horrifying to think that this man, a father himself, could do such a thing to me. To the neighbor who caused me so much pain and fear, I hope we never cross paths again. You've left a scar on my life that's hard to heal. My mom and dad were born in 1960. They had their first kid, my sister Anna, at the start of 1965. This story happens at the beginning of 1966. My dad was away for work, and I wasn't going to be born until the end of 1967. So, it was just my mom and my little sister at home, and they were both really sick with the flu. My mom decided to call her mom to ask for help. It was late at night. My family lived in a big city, while my grandma lived in a nearby town. So my mom called her and asked her to take a taxi and come over. Grandma agreed right away. Enough time passed for grandma to get there. Then my mom heard strange scratching noises at the front door. She felt scared and called out, Mom, is that you? If it's you, why not just ring the bell? There was no answer, just more scratching. My mom got even more scared and called out again, Mom, is that you? If you don't answer, I'll have to call the police. Still, only scratching was heard. So my mom picked up the phone to call for help. Back then, they didn't have 911, so she just dialed the operator. She said, Hi, my name is Mrs. Smith. Someone's scratching at my door and won't say who they are. The operator promised to send someone quickly. The police showed up fast and found an old man in his nightclothes and without shoes at the door. 
He was a neighbor who lived on a different floor with his two daughters. He had lost his memory or something like that and had wandered off. The only thing he was trying to do was find his way back home. It's a bit sad, really. He was lucky it was my mom's door he found, because if he had tried any other door, no one might have heard him, and he could have ended up outside in the freezing cold. It was very cold that night in the middle of winter. His daughters came by the next day. They thanked my mom for finding their dad and said sorry many times for the trouble. I had never felt fear like this before, and I kept quiet about it to my parents, worrying they might stop me from hanging out with my friends. The fear didn't go away, especially after receiving another message from him that night. A message that haunts me still. Hey, I heard you were feeling unwell. I'm sorry for being angry earlier. I thought you were avoiding me on purpose. Hope you get well soon and take your medicine. You haven't had your dinner, have you? Make sure to eat something so you can recover quickly and we can meet at school again. This message made me shiver because I hadn't told anyone I was sick, not even my teacher. And the fact that he knew I hadn't had my dinner by 11 p.m. was terrifying. It felt like someone was watching me. So I quickly closed my curtains, still not daring to tell my parents, hoping it was all just a weird coincidence. I eventually got better and started going to school again. I really didn't want to sit next to him, but our teacher was very strict about seating, so I had no choice. One day, while walking to school, I noticed him following me. My heart sank, and I quickened my pace. But so did he. I was scared, but managed to reach the school and ran towards my friend to tell her everything. She told me to keep my distance from him, which I tried, but he wouldn't leave me alone. Then came Valentine's Day, and our school celebrated it in a big way, canceling classes but still requiring us to come and wear something red. I chose a simple outfit with black jeans, a red shirt, and a black cardigan. That's when I received a bizarre message from him saying he wanted to take a photo of me to look at before he slept, accompanied by a winky face. I didn't know how to react, so I ignored it. But I caught him staring at me, sending chills down my spine. I reported him to our teacher, but nothing was done. My friends tried to keep him away from me. During the day, when a classmate tried to give me chocolates and flowers, Mike gave me angry looks. I tried to ignore him, but later, when I went back to our classroom to grab my forgotten bag, I found Mike sitting alone, staring blankly. The room was empty, everyone else was at the gymnasium, and there we were, alone. Despite my fear, I tried to act brave as I walked to get my bag. Suddenly he screamed, Why won't you like me back? We are meant to be together! His face twisted with anger, and I was frozen in place terrified by his intense glare. After that scary moment in the classroom, I couldn't take it anymore. I broke down and told everything to my friends, then finally to my parents. They were upset and decided to report him to the school authorities. The school promised to talk to him, but he vanished before they could, leaving college to work at a local store. But that wasn't the end of it. He created a new account with his name, but used a photo of me as his profile picture. He sent me a screenshot showing that he had set another picture of me as his phone's wallpaper. The creepiest part was that I didn't recognize this photo. It was taken from outside my window, showing me studying on my bed. The caption he wrote made my blood run cold. I hope to lay next to your bed. I was terrified and broke down crying. My mom told me to block him since we were planning to move to a new town soon. So I blocked him, hoping that would be the end. A year later, I was in ninth grade. Our move had been delayed due to issues with the new house, and that's when he reached out again, using a fake account with my friend Alex's name and picture. I thought it was genuinely Alex creating a new profile, as he had mentioned wanting to do so. The message I received from this account left me in shock. I need to explain. I left school because of you. I told my parents we broke up and I couldn't bear seeing you. I'm sorry for yelling that day, but I want us to be together even have children. If you can't accept me back, that's okay. Just please don't block me. I might kill myself if you do. Love you. Realizing it was Mike, not Alex, I felt physically ill. The thought of blocking him and potentially being responsible for him harming himself was too much. Instead of blocking him, I convinced my parents to contact his. They were deeply ashamed and apologized to us. I learned he was admitted to a mental health facility for treatment. Eventually, my family moved, and I started anew, cutting all ties with Mike and becoming more careful about who I let into my life.
I'm 24 years old, living with my 23-year-old sister and our big dog in a not-so-nice trailer park in a small town somewhere far from the city. This place has a lot of people using drugs, and our landlord doesn't really care who he rents to. It's not great having neighbors who make you feel unsafe, but this is what we can afford, so we just try to stay away from trouble. This happened a few days ago. It was getting really hot and sticky, the kind of weather you dread. And of course our air conditioning broke. Our landlord made it clear he wasn't going to fix it. So, we had to open all the windows and doors trying to catch a breeze. But if you've ever been in a really hot and humid place, you know that doesn't help much. One evening, around 6 p.m., my landlord calls. She says she's got a window AC unit for us, but we'd have to find someone to install it. I thanked her, relieved. Not long after, she shows up with the AC. As she's taking it out of her car, this skinny, pale guy with messy hair, tattoos that looked like they were done in prison, wearing oversized jeans and no shirt, walks over from the trailer across from us. He starts talking to my landlord. Then she does something unexpected. She asks him to help put in the AC for me and then she just leaves. I didn't feel safe with this stranger in my house, but I really wanted the AC working. My sister and our dog were in another room so it was just me and him. I'm not very tall just five or three, and I have a disability that makes me not so strong. This matters because it made me feel even more vulnerable. He opened the box and asked where I wanted the AC. I pointed to the kitchen window and then sat down on the sofa, keeping my distance. He started fixing the AC and began talking about random things, like my name, how old I am, about my disability, and what I do all day. He also asked if I drink or use drugs, I tried to keep my answers short and unclear. Then, he started saying he likes to flirt with the women around here and told me I look younger than I am. This made me feel very uncomfortable, but I just gave a nervous laugh, hoping he would finish quickly. What he said next really scared me. He mentioned he had already met my sister and somehow knew I was often home alone. I didn't know what to say. After a bit, he called me to show how the AC works. I didn't want to go near him, so I stayed back and just nodded. Then he took out his phone and came closer, asking if I wanted his number. I stepped back, saying no, but he insisted, asking how I'd contact him if needed. I told him I'd talk to the landlord if anything came up. Suddenly I found myself trapped against the counter with him blocking the way, suggesting I give him my number instead. I couldn't run or fight him, so I agreed, planning to give him a fake number. When he called it right there, I was so nervous hoping no one would answer. Luckily it went to voicemail, he looked suspicious when it didn't ring, but I lied, saying my phone must be dead. He smirked, saying he'd try again later, and finally left. I'm still scared he might come back when I'm alone. I just hope that never happens. Once I lived in an apartment with my mom while I was studying at university. The people living around us were usually friendly, and the area was pretty good for the most part. But then, everything started to change quickly. A couple moved into the apartment next to ours. They thought if they could fix the place up, they could sell it for more money. This might sound normal, but the problem was that these two were drug users and chose to work on their apartment only at night. Every single night without caring about anyone else, they made a lot of noise. We tried to be patient, thinking it would only last for six months, right? But no, it dragged on for two years and they often worked right by my mom's bedroom wall. Sometimes they even caused our electricity to go out during the hottest days of the year. When my mom complained, they gave a careless sorry, and as she walked away, they said out loud that they should have killed her and her dumb cat. After a while, they tried to sell the apartment, but nobody wanted to buy it because they had damaged it so much. In the end, they just rented it to some of their relatives, who, unsurprisingly, were also drug users. These relatives' kids would wreck the belongings of everyone else, and if anyone tried to confront them, they would threaten them with a gun. Soon, all our neighbors started to move away because they were scared. The police wouldn't help us, and if you called them, you'd be putting your life at risk, which is the opposite of what should happen. My mom could only sleep for two or three hours a night for a whole year. Once she called the police, and the man living next door came over and slashed her car tire in a way that it would burst while she was driving. What's truly terrifying isn't just the danger to my mom, but also to the two little babies she took care of. 
These people were willing to risk killing her and the infants. The final moment for us was during the 4th of July, when they aimed a shotgun at the window I was looking through. Eventually, my sister bought a new house, and we all moved in with her to get away from that nightmare. 